everyone! Welcome to episode 9 of Japan Foundation's Pop Culture Series. I'm Sukuya Mia from Japan Foundation's New York office with my arts and culture teammate, Shun. He's more passionate about today's topic, video games, so I ask him to host tonight's episode. Please take it away! Toon. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for the introduction, Sukuya. Hello and welcome, and thank you again for tuning into our episode focusing on the topic of Japanese video games. Tonight, we'll be looking at the rise, the fall, and the current state of the Japanese video games industry, along with exploring what makes Japanese games so appealing to the world. To do so, we have invited the following esteemed guests who will be providing us with their expertise and presentations. Our first guest is Mr. Chris Kohler, Editorial Director at the gaming studio Digital Eclipse. Prior to his current position, he was a veteran journalist with an extensive background in video game history, writing for publications such as Wired and Kotaku. He is also the author of Power Up, How Japanese Video Games Gave the World an Extra Life, and Final Fantasy V. Our second guest is Dr. Mir Consalvo, Professor and Canada Research Chair in Game Studies and Design at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. Mia also runs MLab, a space dedicated to developing innovative methods for studying games and game players. She's the author of Cheating, Gaining Advantage in Video Games, as well as Atari to Zelda, Japan's Video Games in Global Context. Our third guest is Dr. Hut Rachel Hutchinson, Professor of Japanese Studies from the University of Delaware. She's the author of Nagai Kafu's Occidentalism, Defining the Japanese Self, and Japan, Japanese Culture Through Video Games, which was nominated for the John Whitney Hall Book Prize at the Association of Asian Studies. So tonight we'll begin our program with a pre-recorded presentation from each guest speaker. Chris is going to start us off with the history of how Japanese video games rose to prominence when the global games industry was still in its infancy. Following Chris's presentation, Mio will briefly touch upon the fall of the Japanese games industry, as well as examining what makes Japanese games uniquely Japanese. After their presentations, Rachel, who is our lead moderator tonight, will discuss how Japanese games rediscovered itself in recent years with Chris and Mia, and then we'll jump right into answering your questions. Although we received a lot of great questions from our registrants already, we will be choosing and answering a few from our live audience at the end, so please feel free to ask them in the YouTube live chat during the stream. Also, this is a quick reminder to please keep the chat clean and friendly while you're there. And with that, let's get right into the presentations, and I'll see you all later again during the Q&A session. Please enjoy. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much to the Japan Foundation New York for inviting me to be here tonight alongside uh, Drs. Consalvo and Hutchinson. Uh, again, my name is Chris Kohler. Uh, currently, I am editorial director at a video game developer called Digital Eclipse out in Emeryville, California. And what we do is we produce both collections of classic games for modern systems, like Blizzard Arcade Collection came out this year, uh, as well as new games that are steeped in the traditions of classic games, such as uh, Space Jam, A New Legacy, the video game, which also came out this month. Um, prior to this, I spent 24 years as a journalist. Much of that was spent as the gaming editor at Wired Magazine, although my career kicked off writing about Japanese games specifically for Viz Media publications such as Game On USA, On America, and for a brief period of time, Shonen Jump. Uh, I received a Fulbright Fellowship to Kyoto, Japan in 2002 to write my first book, uh, Power Up, How Japanese Video Games Gave the World an Extra Life, which was the first book in English uh, entirely about Japanese games. My most recent book was Final Fantasy V for Boss Fight Books, which is all about the history of this one very important Japanese role-playing game, and also about the experience of growing up in the late 80s, early 90s as a fan of Japanese games uh, on anime and manga in an era where those things were much more difficult to access and experience uh, outside Japan than they are today. Uh, in the late 80s, with limited exception, we didn't watch Japanese movies in America, and we didn't really read manga or watch anime. We didn't read Haruki Murakami, you know, but there was one Japanese cultural export that was not only freely available, it was the dominant player in that entertainment space, and it was absolutely everywhere. Video games. So, just to rewind a bit, 
Video games had their origins in the United States. The first arcade game was called Computer Space. It was created in 1971 by the company that would soon be known as Atari. Uh, yes, that's a Japanese word, but it's an American company. Uh, and in 1972, the television maker Magnavox released the first home TV-based video game console, the Odyssey. But neither of those products were actually successful. Um, what was successful was Atari's next arcade game, which was called Pong. I hope I don't have to explain to you too much about what's going on in this screenshot here. Um, but by the next year, 1973, you could also play Pong in Japan, either officially uh, or via these sort of ersatz versions that were made by Japanese amusement makers like Sega and Taito. And from these humble beginnings, uh, the video game industry began to grow. Uh, American games like Breakout would be released in Japan, and so too would original Japanese games like Western Gun be released in America and elsewhere. But everything changed with 1978's Space Invaders. Created by a Taito engineer named Tomohiro Nishikado, uh, Space Invaders was the nascent game industry's first huge blockbuster, uh, a massive worldwide success that would inspire and define so much of what came later. Prior to Space Invaders, we saw abstractions like the simple blocks of Pong or Breakout. You know, we saw driving games with cars or sports games like football, but, but Space Invaders took us out of real life and put us into um, a dramatic fantasy world. Uh, a cataclysmic scenario in which aliens were invading Earth and you were humanity's last hope. Um, and you always lose. <laughs> uh, th there's a lot to say about Space Invaders, but I would also point out um, these uh, illustrations from Nishikado. While he was developing the game, he created these now instantly recognizable, and I would say very adorable, very marketable, and just unquestionably kawaii uh, alien characters that today all over the world, um, these, the, certainly the, the, the pixel versions of these characters are used uh, and understood as, as an icon um, that has this uh, specific, you know, synonymous meaning with video games. And, you know, even beyond um, Nishikado's innovations and perfections of the gameplay mechanics that would be so inspirational, Space Invaders, I would argue, is the beginning of um, the, the manga and anime-inspired Japanese uh, visual aesthetic starting to express itself worldwide through the medium of video games. You know, even if the people playing Space Invaders in the 1970s, you know, didn't know that, um, they were engaging with characters that were really steeped in this uh, manga um, and this, uh, this kawaii tradition. This would only increase in the early 1980s with two more massive worldwide blockbusters that had their origins uh, in Japan. Those being Pac-Man from 1980 and Donkey Kong 1981. In both cases here, we see the development of mascot characters with strong designs, um, colorful art that in the case of Pac-Man was made specifically um, to have an appeal also to women, not just the traditionally male arcade game player. Uh, and in the case of Donkey Kong, a, a game that actually has a complete beginning to end storyline, which would become an essential feature of games in the very near future. So Donkey Kong was also the debut of the character Mario and uh, the directorial debut of a Nintendo designer named Shigeru Miyamoto, who would soon become the key creative figure in the Japanese video game revolution. We've been talking a lot about arcade games so far because in the late 70s and the beginning of the 80s, that's where a lot of the creativity was happening. The, the content on home machines was by and large, not entirely, but mostly, sort of downgraded versions of the, um, the the arcade experience. Now, there were many different home gaming platforms being sold around the world by the early 1980s. They, they had evolved from so-called dedicated machines that played only a few built-in games. We can see um, here uh, Atari's Home Pong console and also uh, TV Vader, uh, which was a Japan-only dedicated console that played a basically a knockoff version of Space Invaders. It was by a company called uh, Epic, and it was uh, not <laughs> licensed from the makers of Space Invaders. 
And, um, you know, these, these, uh, these dedicated machines soon gave way to the more modern style video game machines that played games uh, that were sold separately on ROM cartridges, where the game itself was stored on a chip on the cartridge. In America, the market for home video games uh, actually crashed around the year 1983, and, and, and retailers and customers alike assumed that uh, home video game consoles had been a passing fad, and uh, you know that like the hula hoop and like pet rocks, they'd had their time in the sun, and that was all over now. But there had not been such a crash in Japan. And in fact, in 1983, uh, same year that everything was sort of, you know, going uh, belly up in, in America, um, in 1983 in Japan came the launch of the platform that would end up defining the next generation of video games the whole world over, which was Nintendo's Family Computer, or the Famicom for short. Originally designed to play high-quality versions of Nintendo's arcade games like Donkey Kong or Popeye, um, the Famicom soon became the primary platform for Nintendo's designers. They could start to craft lengthy adventure games that players could sit and play for hours, not the one to five minutes of an arcade game session. This, of course, had started happening in the U.S. too, but it was cut off by the premature crash of the console business, which Nintendo saw as an opportunity, because in 1985, when it launched the Famicom as the Nintendo Entertainment System, or the NES in America, Nintendo was able to swoop in and just immediately take over 90% of the market for video games in the U.S., because everyone else had left. And much of this success was thanks to the brilliant, groundbreaking work of Shigeru Miyamoto and the small team of designers who worked alongside of him. The NES's killer app was Super Mario Brothers, which again took players into this fully realized fantasy world with very strong character design, cartoon-like graphics, a, a musical theme song that was so catchy that you can probably hear it in your head just from looking at this image, and importantly, all of this was built on the backbone of very strong gameplay mechanics that had a very precise feel to them that other gameplay designers would study for decades just to try to replicate. Mario took over the world. You could watch Mario cartoons, eat Mario breakfast cereal, and later watch the Super Mario Brothers Hollywood movie. Of course, these were all Americanized interpretations of the core Japanese product at the center of it all. In Japan, you would watch Mario anime, or you would sprinkle Mario furikake on top of your bowl of rice. Um, only the, the Mario game itself was deemed something that Western audiences would want to consume in its original form. Now, Nintendo wasn't the only maker of Famicom games. Um, most other Japanese game-making companies, publishers, they, they produced Famicom games as well. And the global success of Famicom as the NES provided a lot of these companies the springboard that they needed to start sort of opening or expanding their U.S. branches and distributing game cartridges worldwide. And in contrast to today, when I think the, the perceived Japanese-ness of a product is, if anything, a selling point around the world, um, it, publishers often uh, tried to obscure that with their initial games for the NES. Um, they'd substitute uh, the, the, the anime-style illustrations on the game's box. They would swap in uh, a more realistic uh, style of, of character or a more American comic style. Um, or they would, say, take a game that was based on a popular anime character that was known in Japan and erase that character entirely and then sell the game with a sort of a generic character in uh, worldwide territories. Um, it, no, it, like, here's an example. Obake no Kyutaro, the popular anime, was released in the U.S. as Chubby Cherub with this little sort of angel guy replacing the popular licensed character. Now, so far we focused a lot on Nintendo, and it's, it's very easy to do that because they were just such the dominant uh, player in the worldwide games market at the time. But we shouldn't ignore that, um, you know, developing on a parallel track to all this, uh, we had the Japanese computer games business. Um, and, and this is something that's not really been looked into nearly as much, I think, by um, uh, people outside of Japan studying the Japanese games business. But what was going on with Japanese computers was fascinating because whereas 
was the Famicom was much more of this uh, sort of a sanitized ecosystem that was aimed at, you know, everything really needed to be kind of appropriate for younger kids. Um, in, in, in on the, the, the computer platforms, we see development of, um, you know, it, it just, just sort of name one genre, these very deep um, graphical, uh, text-based, story-based, uh, you know, dense adventure games that were very specifically for adults. You know, they, they have PG-13 or even R-rated sensibilities, you know, violence and, and, and uh, you know, even uh, erotic elements. Um, and we kind of start to see that start to enter the console business, you know, maybe versions of these games. And we especially kind of start to see that um, once competitors to Nintendo begin to emerge. So technology was of course evolving incredibly rapidly during uh, during this uh, this phase um and uh it's important to remember that when you know nintendo was having its biggest successes with the nes platform uh around the world in 1987 1988 it was five-year-old hardware you know it was based on chips that were that were produced very cheaply in the year 1983 um and so they're the challengers in the space the companies that were not nintendo were able to produce machines by that point that were much more technologically adept um you know more colors on screen more definition on screen better music more storage um but Nintendo was having such success with the Famicom platform that it was it was not really willing to put a new machine out there too early, um, lest it sort of mess with its own business. But um, uh, competitors like Sega and NEC, both of which were Japanese companies, ended up creating more powerful platforms called the Mega Drive and the PC Engine. And you know these end up becoming the number two and number three you know game platforms around the around the U.S. as well. Japanese hardware was really the global standard. Um, and therefore, Japanese content made on those machines was sort of the primary content that people all over the world ended up playing. Nintendo ends up following up with the Super Famicom or Super NES, which was quite successful all over the world as, as well. Now, as time goes on, we start to see less of a push to remove that Japanese-ness uh, from these games. And not coincidentally, I think that this goes hand in hand with uh, the growing popularity of manga and anime uh, outside of Japan. Um, I think a, a fun example of this we should look at is um, the, the Super NES games that were based on the uh, manga and anime series, very popular one called Ranma One Half. Um, and um, the, the first game in the series was localized as Street Combat in America. And all of the colorful characters, you know, from Ranma One Half were removed from the game and redrawn, kind of crudely redrawn, as these very generic uh, Western style superheroes. Um, but when the sequel to this game was released, uh, the original Ranma world was actually left intact. And the, the magazine ad for this game actually said, you know, okay, play the game, read the comic, watch the video. Because at that by that point, you could actually buy the Ranma One Half comic in the US and you could buy the anime and you could actually consume all of, all of the media. Um, and of, of course, Ranma One Half, you know, as a one-on-one -on -one martial arts fighting game followed right in the footsteps of Street Fighter 2, um, the the Japanese game that uh, really revolutionized uh, the arcade um, market all over again in 1991 by uh, introducing, you know, very much the uh, the, the idea of the one-on-one the -on -one competition. Uh, and that sort of became the dominant uh, mode in the arcade from then on. Um, so while all of this is going on, a, a new technology called the CD-ROM is promising to change the way that games are made. Put simply, the game cartridges that ran on systems like Famicom were expensive to manufacture and had a limited amount of storage space for game data. Um, and so CD-ROMs, on the other hand, very cheap to manufacture and had exponentially more storage. And this is where Nintendo actually kind of starts to lose what had been its ironclad grip on the global games market. Because as the industry shifts to CD-ROMs, Nintendo, for a variety of reasons, decides to stick with cartridges. And ultimately, what consumers and game publishers both wanted was CD games. Now, there were many competing CD-ROM-based game machines from Japanese, American, and European console makers, and anything could have happened at this point. Um, but what did happen was, improbably, a, a brand new entrant into the video game space ended up becoming 
very quickly as globally dominant as Nintendo had been, if not more so, uh, and that was Sony with its PlayStation. So CDs didn't just mean, you know, bigger games with more storage that were less expensive at retail. It meant those things, and that was important to players. But from the publisher side, CDs could be manufactured much more quickly than game cartridges with all their different parts and circuit boards and chips and plastic. You could do a run of CDs much more easily than that. And you could produce uh, smaller quantities at a time. And, and what that meant is that publishers could, could afford to be more experimental. They, they, publishing a CD game was such a lower risk. They, they could, if you look at a game like, for example, Parappa the Rapper, this was an early Sony hit about a, about a rapping cartoon dog. Um, it's hard to imagine this game even happening at all on a, on a riskier uh, cartridge-based platform. This was supposed to be a, just a niche game that ended up being a surprise hit. Um, and the CD-ROM format itself kind of afforded that kind of possibility. Uh, of course, it's hard to get to this point uh, without talking about Final Fantasy VII. So, going back a little bit, computer role-playing games, role-playing games on personal computers like Wizardry and Ultima, um, these have become very popular on Japanese PCs, and th those were those were uh, you know Western-made games, um, and, and Japanese designers were very influenced by games like that to to, to start to create a new type of role-playing game. Um, that had more like simplified gameplay, something that could actually work on a, on a console, um, which had you know a small controller with a few buttons instead of a big keyboard, you know, which is in the living room and the kids played it, you know, anime aesthetics, you know, something that would that, that kind of simplified the experience down, um, but still had you know engrossing narratives and still kind of gave people that feeling of of playing a, a role playing game. And um, RPGs like Dragon Quest uh, and Final Fantasy in the late 1980s um, were huge million sellers in the Japanese market. But despite many efforts, they didn't really become popular outside of Japan. That is, until Final Fantasy VII, um, a game that shipped on three CD-ROMs for the PlayStation, was this amazing graphical showpiece. It was the game you bought to show off your PlayStation, even if you didn't really like RPGs. Then a lot of people decide that they do like Japanese RPGs thanks to that, and uh, the, the genre really took off. And, and today, Japanese role-playing games are very popular worldwide. Um, that really that really began um, the, here with the, the PlayStation CD-ROM technology. Uh, Metal Gear Solid, another landmark uh, achievement in this sort of cinematic, story-based 3D gaming that was kind of enabled by CD-ROM technology. And here again, you have to you can't really fully understand it unless you look back at the Japanese PC space because that was where um, this game's director, Hideo Kojima, had spent all of his time prior to making Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation. Um, I mean, Metal Gear Solid 2 becomes this massive hit for the PlayStation, a hugely influential work in the development of the, the cinematic action game. Um, and, and things don't really change that much for the next round of game machines. Nintendo and Sega uh, both came up with, you know, appealing new machines to try to attempt to dethrone Sony, but it, Sony just didn't make any mistakes, and it very smoothly transitioned from PlayStation 1 to PlayStation 2, which now had a DVD-ROM drive. <laughs> uh, and this was the situation in the year 2000 as the new millennium was dawning. While the, the individual players were shifting positions, Japan was still very much the winning team worldwide. Uh, in January 2002, uh, the editors of the American magazine Electronic Gaming Monthly voted for their top 100 games of all time. And 93 of the games on that list were Japanese. You know, certainly uh, American game makers occupied at, at that time a stronger position than they had in the last you know 15 years um a, a lot of that was largely on the strength of, of games that were had been developed on pc formats um so you know games like first person shooters like doom and quake which japanese designers really had no interest in um and uh and of course the surprise breakout success of the game developed in the united kingdom called grand theft auto 3. Uh, now, American game makers have been trying to get into the hardware space all this time, um, but none had ever come close to succeeding. But one was coming in that had the determination and, you know, importantly, the, the nearly bottomless pockets of money to try to establish a foothold in what had been, for 15 years, um, the near-exclusive domain of Japanese hardware makers. And I think you can look at Microsoft and its Xbox, which played a big part in taking those game genres that have been popular with American PC players and moving those those games and the players into the console space. 
you can kind of look at that as the beginning of the end of Japan's total, you know, dominance of the console space worldwide. So, thank you. Uh, to continue with the story, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Mia Consalvo. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the Q&A session. Hi, I'm Mia, and this is my presentation about Japan's video games in global contexts. And if you're looking for more, uh, you can read my book, Atari to Zelda, Jeff, Japan's Video Games in Global Context from MIT Press. It has a lot more details and a lot more pictures as well. And just to give you a quick overview of what I want to talk about. So uh, two key themes, a game's Japanese-ness, uh, you know, like when you think about a game from Japan and certain elements associated with it, um, these can both help or hinder its sales depending on the game and the market. So I'll talk a little bit about both of those during this presentation. And also for game companies, figuring out who and which, you know, which markets to appeal to <clears throat> and how is increasingly tricky as the game market gets more sophisticated and more developed. This is a lovely quote to begin with. So this is in 2010 at the Tokyo Game Show. Keiji Unafune, who was at the time the Capcom head of game development, said to the press that Japan's developers are at least five years behind and we're still, everyone is making awful games. <clears throat> and this got quite a bit of attention, as you can imagine. And I am not here to debate whether those games are terrible or not, uh, but at the time he was pointing to a phenomenon that other people were starting to talk about as well. And this was that Japan's share of the market was really starting to shrink. In 2002, uh, they had 50% of the global market, versus in 2010, less than 10 years later, they were down to 10%. And I'm not sure what it is now, if it's gone up or down slightly, but we are definitely not at 50% like they used to be. And so the question is, you know, like, what happened? <clears throat> and how is Japan or our Japanese studios uh, trying to recoup elements of that market share. And one more just data point here. Uh, in 2013, the top selling game in the US was Grand Theft Auto V, uh, the same in Europe. But in Japan, the top selling game was Mon Monster Hunter 4. And I think this points to part of the disparity as well, in that there were some <clears throat> differences emerging in what was interesting to different markets, to different domestic markets. And also there was a rise of studios uh, that could compete successfully with Japanese studios that had enjoyed a lot of dominance over the years. And this is just a little bit more recent chart. <clears throat> so you can see here in yellow, these are the games that crossed over uh, across the US and Japanese uh, markets. This is um, for June of this year. There are only four that are on both. And what's interesting also to point out is that there are actually some other games on the US chart uh, from Japan, including Mario Kart and Mortal Kombat and Resident Evil. We don't always see quite as many Japanese games in that top 10 anymore. But that if you look at the, J the Japan side, nearly all of these are Japanese. Um, there aren't as many uh, foreign titles um, that you would see like in a US or European uh, chart. So what are these Japanese companies <clears throat> that want to make games that sell globally going to do? And we have this concept of localization, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but it's the idea of making what's strange familiar. And there's another way to talk about it, uh, glocalizing, which is a horrible word, but I didn't make it up. But it's this uh, way of making global products seem more familiar to specific local markets. And this goes way beyond video games. So. Uh, you know, like the McDonald's has uh, food products that they market only in Japan or only in the U.S. or, you know, wherever else that they are. Um, Kit Kat has <clears throat> way more flavors and brands available in Japan uh, than they do in the U.S. or Canada. Although I will happily point out that now we have the matcha Kit Kat in Canada. But games do this as well. So this is the surface level uh, localization. So with FIFA, for example... It's the same game, but uh, companies will change the cover to appeal to uh, you know, different markets so that they have local players uh, being featured um, for each of the different markets that they're in. 
But localization is more than just language translation or adjusting a cover. It can include uh, more detailed things like changing the actual art in the game itself. So here you see on the left the Western version of Crash Bandicoot, and on the right the uh, Japanese version where he's a little bit more anime. And this is Earthbound. Uh, it's a little hard to see. On the left is the US version of the main character, Ness, uh, where he's wearing pajamas, striped pajamas. And on the right, he's naked. That's the Japanese version. Apparently, in the West, we're not allowed to see little boys naked. Um, but in Japan, you can, as long as they're wearing a hat. So what I want to do next is go into a little bit of detail about one company and how they have attempted localization. And that's Capcom. Capcom is an interesting one because they have been around for a long time. They've been really successful. Uh, and they've also been kind of unabashedly global in their approach. You know, they're not just interested in a local market or, you know, like selling regionally. Uh, and they also are really interested in creating large series that endure over time. You can see here, <clears throat> these are just a few of them. <clears throat> so there's Street Fighter, Dead Rising, Monster Hunter, Resident Evil. And here are just a few sales figures. These are a few years old, so I'm sure they've sold even more. Um, but Resident Evil, as you can see, has sold more than 60 million units, uh, Monster Hunter at 28, and so on and so forth. And what this shows is, you know, like I said, that Capcom is interested in <clears throat> series that endure over time, um, but also they've been very canny about uh, releasing, you know, like consecutive games uh, that fall within a certain universe. They also have carefully thought about, you know, like certain versions of games to release in certain markets or in, you know, particular platforms and figuring out like the intricacies of who uh, would be interested in what flavor of that particular Resident Evil game, for example, uh, is something that they've, you know, carefully considered for a long time. And it doesn't mean that they always get it right, but that they're constantly thinking about it. I should also point out, um, just for the Clover Studio fans, that Capcom is largely interested in large franchises that successfully endure. Um, this wasn't always the case. For a while, they had this little internal studio called Clover. Uh, and these developers were told, make innovative, interesting, kind of mold-breaking games. And you know, like, do what you want. And this is a screenshot from Okami, uh, which is one of my favorite games of all time. And that's largely what the studio did. However, they did not sell very well. <clears throat> and so as one um, columnist pointed out, um, publishers will cut away the developers that don't produce games that make them money. You know, I'm sure that Clover Studios, uh, their budget was like a drop in the bucket of what Capcom uh, makes in a year. But because they weren't commercially successful, uh, they decided that they weren't worth the expenditure and rather they'd spend time on proven franchises like Street Fighter. So <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about one of the franchises, uh, Devil May Cry. And this is Dante. He's the main character. And you can see here, um, these are a few of the incarnations of Dante over the years. Um, on the left most is uh, Devil May Cry 3. And on the right is DMC which was the rebooted version um, at the time that I examined the series. And you can see he's kind of gone from uh, more of an anime um, pretty boy to on the right, he's almost like a bro, like a Western bro. Like his hair has changed from like a dyed white to more of just like a buzz cut brown. Um, <clears throat> and his uh, clothing is not as flashy. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it fades into the background a little bit more, right? So DMC um, was actually created and developed by Ninja Theory, which was a Western studio that Capcom contracted with uh, to make this, this game in the series. And what they were hoping was that employing a Western studio would uh, bring in and, and help them figure out how to attract more uh, Western players. Ninja Theory had made games like Heavenly Sword and Enslaved. And, um, they hadn't done a lot before that, but they were interested and eager to try. 
And there was a lot made of how uh, much research they put into the game, like fashion and clothes and uh, swords and history. And what's interesting about that is that, I mean, anybody could do research, um, but somehow it was felt that because it was a Western studio doing it, that somehow they would have a better finger on the pulse, right, of what Western players um, would be interested in. But I think what's even more significant in terms of like what uh, Ninja Theory was bringing was revamping the game's feel. And so there was attention being paid to how you move the character in space and the animations that make up the character movements. So in the earlier games, uh, the animation for when your character moves and like changes direction might be a little clunky, but in the West, um, there's much more of a tendency to make animations as smooth as possible to make them seem sort of photorealistic. And that was something that Ninja Theory was striving to do. And this was something, you know, like they felt that would be useful in attracting more Western players. And what's key here to point out is that, you know, the interests and um, predilections of the Western player are suddenly much more important than the interests and predilections of the Japanese player. And you can say, well, the Japanese market is not as big, um, but we are seeing, you know, like the, uh, the dominance, the coming dominance of like what Western players think and want and feel in terms of the games. And here is just another quote summing that up. So, you know, like the Western games focus a lot on that realism um, which tends to look very good. And so you're seeing that sort of take precedence in terms of like this company thinking this is what's going to get us more Western players. We need more Western players if we're going to do well with our sales. Unfortunately, um, this doesn't always work. So there were several reasons uh, that Capcom's earnings for that period um, were not as high as they expected. Um, but they did fall back and say that they, uh, they felt that the quality of the games being produced was not as high as it should be, um, and that it was being uh, blamed on excessive outsourcing. And so it was this idea that perhaps the studio didn't get it right, that they were not being true to the vision. So just to say that even though, you know, like localization is sort of held out as this promise for what might, you know, attract more Western players or whatever you know, group you want to um, bring in, it's not necessarily going to work. <clears throat> On the flip side of the coin, uh, from trying to localize games, you are seeing a little bit of an increase in some Japanese games that are sort of reveling in their Japanese-ness, right? That they're seeing this as a selling point uh, in the West. This tends to work pretty well if the games are uh, a little more niche, you know, if they're not going for the huge AAA audiences, or perhaps they know that there is enough of like a, like a series, for example, that uh, will appeal, um, maybe like the Ace Attorney um, games that you see here. Um, but these are just some games, for example, that, you know, are not trying to go for localization as much, you know, they will be translated um, but they're not trying to take away the elements of the game that even Western players might see as like elements of Japanese-ness. So let's interrogate this concept of Japanese-ness a little bit more. To get at this, um, I should point out, I did some research with Western game designers because I was interested in their own influences uh, when they were playing games growing up and then when they started making games and the influence of Japanese games on them right, on them personally and then in their practice. And what I quickly found was just like there are multiple game industries, there was no like one influence of Japanese games on developers. And that it was roughly broken up into these periods here, right, like 80s, 90s, and then 2000s kind of going forward. And this corresponded somewhat with like different attitudes in the West towards Japan. However, it also corresponded to certain technological developments within the game industry. So for example, 
<clears throat> Gordon Walton, who um, is, I would say, one of the first generation of game developers um, out there, mentioned, you know, when he started game development, first of all, game development wasn't really a thing, right? Like there was no industry. He was one of the founders of the industry and he was using punch cards. So if that doesn't date him, I don't know what else does. Uh, but I mean, he was using punch cards to create games and um, there was, for him, uh, there was no Japanese influence because there was no Japanese industry to refer to, right? Like, and there was no other culture. He was helping to make it. Moving a little bit further forward, um, Brenda Romero, who designed the Wizardry games, said that you know when she was growing up in the 80s in Western New York, um, there were zero game stores, right? So like she had no access. Um, the few games that she could find uh, were American games, and so again, you know, you see here that there's very little influence uh, for those for those early designers. However, once you move forward like about 10 years and you start seeing the rise of like Cool Japan, um, you know, like the greater circulation of anime and manga, then things start to shift and slightly younger game designers are mentioning uh, this influence. So for example, Jason Rohr um, talked about how uh, when Super Mario 3 came out, he was obsessed with getting the game and it was in short supply. So every day he called Toys R Us to ask if it was available and I think he told me that the day that it was finally there, uh, like his mother wasn't home and he was trying to beg a neighbor to drive him there. And like, it was this really, really big deal. And Colleen Macklin, um, another designer talked about, you know, when she got Super Mario World, you know, staying up 36 hours to play it when it first came out. So now you're starting to see like these games having an influence on designers. We don't know exactly what that is yet. I'll get to that in a second but that this is, these games are forming part of their like, cultural canon. So here I wanna distinguish games that are from Japan versus of Japan and how I think people talked about them. And this will again relate to Japanese-ness. So when I say a game is from Japan, obviously that means it was created in Japan, but we can argue about like, exactly what that means. But here, what I mean is there's not anything essentially Japanese that appealed to the person or influenced the person, uh, like the designer here, um, in their later game development career. So for example, uh, one of the designers talked about um, Mario games and the control panel, like the control scheme and like the jump and how the game is so well designed in terms of like the movement and like the physics and that this was really important, you know, like the sense that you are actually controlling the figure, that there's like gravity that you can understand and like you have to move with and against. And so this was something that they, in their game, you know, tried to emulate as well, like uh, the, the feel of the game's gameplay system. Similarly, another designer talked about <clears throat> um, the game Dance Dance Revolution and how you know, movement-based games were really interesting and how he thought about, you know, like using alternate controllers um, as a way to, you know, play a game. And so he created this game Button, um, which has these large buttons and involves movement rather than like a standard like keypad controller, right? Uh, another designer talked about um, AI <clears throat> and the programming of Pac-Man and the behavior of the ghosts and how like the ghosts were designed to seem like they each, you know, they each had their personality and their movement. And it was, it seemed like it was AI, but it was really a trick, but that this got him interested in programming and AI and his career, he went on to help work on Skyrim. Um, but like that this early Japanese game was sort of an influence on like how he thought about how games were constructed. And finally uh, with Doom, uh, John Romero, the developer that I talked with, mentioned with Final Fantasy games, um, the importance of sound and music in heightening the mood and setting the scene for games, and that this was really influential for him and in the games that he made and the importance, again, of sound and music. So those are elements you know, of games that came from Japan, but you could say that those elements are not necessarily Japanese, right? Like the importance of sound or game feel. It's just that the games themselves were developed by Japanese developers. 
In contrast, uh, there were a few games that people talked about or experiences where it was the Japaneseness of the game itself that seemed to appeal to them. And the overwhelming favorite uh, at the time when I talked to folks was Katamari Damacy. And it was not just elements of the game, like bento boxes um, or, you know, like miniature toys, um, but also, like, people mentioned, you know, the idea that, um, like, the, the whimsy, the ridiculousness, the, um, like, the joy that was involved, you know, that it wasn't about killing things, um, that these were all elements, like, literally, I'll make the pun, wrapped up, you know, in the game itself, and that they felt like these were elements that could only have come out of a game um, from Japan. Interestingly, um, the game Journey was mentioned a couple times about, you know, people said, like, this game feels like a Japanese game, right? Like, and then they'd say, is it really from Japan? I'm not sure. And curiously, it's not. Uh, it's developed by that game company, uh, which is in the U.S., but the lead designer, Geneva Chen, is a Chinese man. And his name, Geneva, uh, that he adopted when he came to the West is taken from Final Fantasy. He was so influenced by Japanese games, that was the name he chose when he started learning English. And he will admit that Japanese games played a huge role uh, in his game development journey, and that he was interested in games that provoked emotions in players other than just fear or anger. And so like the games that he's created, like Journey and Flow and Flower, are to try and explore other emotions. And so this is where we get into this interesting space of like, what does that mean to be of Japan? <clears throat> you could also argue even more recent games like Ghost of Tsushima, uh, which is created by a Western studio. You know, like, is this, how is this of Japan? It's made by a Western studio, um, but it's about samurai. Uh, it features haiku, but people will argue the historical period it's set in was before when haiku was invented. Uh, it uses a Kurosawa filter as an optional thing for players. So it's like drawing on Japanese themes and elements uh, in different ways. We can argue about like the cultural appropriateness of doing so. But again, like this is another way that we can think about like the influence of Japanese-ness right, on the industry. The way that I like to think about Japanese-ness is Wittgenstein's concept of the family resemblance. Um, Wittgenstein talked about, let's, we'll use the example of birds. You know, like, there may be no one definition that fits what a bird is, you know, but we think of a constellation of traits. Like, you know, all these birds have wings, maybe, um, but there's probably some bird out there that doesn't, but not all birds can fly, right? So this penguin can't fly, but these other birds can. We can think about, like, what are the different range of elements that make up birdness, you know, and you probably have 8 out of 10, right? Um, and somebody else has a different 8 out of 10, some different bird does. And so, like, we get at, like, a sense of birdness, um, and I think that's a more helpful way to think about what Japanese-ness is. So I would argue that Japanese-ness, um, it's a set of associations, so it can be associated with certain platforms, uh, um, certain genres, I'm sorry, like the JRPG or a platformer. It's a historical group of games, so people will always think of like the Mario or the Final Fantasy games as being of, like essentially Japanese. <clears throat> um, it can also be a convenient rhetoric, you know. So like when a game designer or a game studio fails in selling well, they can sort of hide behind the Japanese. They can say like, "Oh, well, our game just isn't understood by Western players," or. If it's a game like Catherine, they can hopefully market the game as having lots of Japanese-ness. And so it's really this changing set of expectations. There's really nothing essential about Japanese-ness. It's this uh, floating set of signifiers that we use to sort of understand like certain elements of games. So just to conclude, Japanese games are not the predominant force in the multiple contemporary game industries anymore, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but it's, you know, we just, we, there's way more competition now than there's ever been. But if you want to be a AAA developer, you've got to appeal to a global market to make a profit, which often means catering to Western tastes. Uh, unless you want to go small and stick with a domestic market in Japan, you know, the Western market uh, and the Western taste is something that you have to confront. And in that sense, Japanese-ness 
you know, it's something you can either embrace, right, that you're going to double down on it, like the ghost of Tsushima, or um, if it doesn't, if you try and localize and it doesn't sell well, you can say, well, uh, you know, people just didn't understand. But to better understand local, national, and regional games, um, you know, we should look, I think, at the family resemblances of different games rather than essential or reified qualities. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you so much to Chris and Mia for those wonderful presentations. We've seen the early growth of Japanese games over time from the 1980s through the 2000s, and then the growth of the industry and how Japanese studios have adapted to the global market, as well as how Western game designers have taken inspiration from Japanese games and from Japan itself. Uh, the name of our session today is How the Japanese Video Game Industry Found lost and rediscovered its way. So I'd just like to add a few brief comments on that rediscovery before we start the overall discussion. So I went into Target the other day and I was browsing around the video game section and I noticed the largest section by far was for games on the Nintendo Switch. This is a console that came out in 2017 and it really revitalized Nintendo and the industry overall, I think. One of the launch titles for the Switch was Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, taking the popular series to the open world format. Another big one was Mario Kart 8. Also, we had Animal Crossing New Horizons, which got a lot of us through quarantine when the world shut down for COVID-19. Monster Hunter, which Mia was talking about, had a new game out called Monster Hunter Stories, and I also saw Hyrule Warriors there, a hack and slash game based on the characters from Breath of the Wild. So it looks like the Switch is doing extremely well here in the US. I think 2017 is a really significant year in the Japanese game industry, marking a turnaround in global sales and just new titles more generally. Just before the Nintendo Switch came out, you had Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain, uh, that was released in 2015 on the PlayStation 3 and 4, the Xbox One, Xbox 360 and Microsoft Windows. Uh, that was another huge open world and the fastest selling game to that date. It shipped 3 million copies in just five days. In fighting games, we can see a similar resurgence with Tekken 7 coming out in 2015 and Soul Calibur 6, one of my favourites, was uh, 2018. Uh, in role-playing games, of course, we had Final Fantasy 15 released in 2016 and this one uh, took place in an open world with multiplayer possibilities and a lot of downloadable content expansions as well. Dragon Quest XI came out in 2017, and that's shipped more than 6 million copies at this point. So these old, old JRPGs from the 1980s that Chris was talking about, uh, they're still going strong in uh, new iterations, which I find really exciting. Uh, lately, you also have a lot of re-releases of old classics. I saw um, Tales of Vesperia 10-year anniversary HD edition, uh, you've also got Capcom's remakes, of course, of Resident Evil 2 and 3. Um, and, of course, the one that everybody's talking about, the new remake of Final Fantasy VII. Um, I have not played it uh, yet because I love the original so much, but I don't think I'll be able to hold out much longer uh, given all the hype and the fact that all my students are playing it and Chris himself just recommended it to me <laughs> as well. So I think I'm going to have to uh, play that one. Uh, and finally, you know, you have some uh, breakout hits, some small things that people didn't expect to do so well, but uh, things like Near Automata, um, that's from uh, Square Enix uh, in 2017. Uh, that one was so popular, you know, they played its music uh, during the Olympic Games Parade of Nations the other day, along with some of the Final Fantasy music and, and so on. So at this point in time, I mean, from my perspective, um, it looks like the Japanese game industry has uh, rediscovered its way a little, and it'll be interesting to see where it's heading in the future. Uh, we have a lot of questions from our registered audience that were submitted ahead of time, uh, some of which are about the future, 
uh, many more of which are about the past, touching on points raised in the presentations, and also just generally asking uh, questions about specific games and their localization. And so uh, we want to hit on some of those in the discussion tonight. Um, and if you have questions on the YouTube chat, of course, um, we can moderate those as well. Uh, but I'd just like to start by asking Chris and Mia what they think of my trip to Target. <laughs> um, is, is this proof that the Japanese games industry is, is back on track? Or uh, what do you think? I think Japan is <clears throat> kind of like it's it's figured out um, what does it do best. I mean, I think that was sort of what was kind of happening in the, the 2000, the, the late 2000s to 2010s. Japan starts to lose its grip a little bit and it starts thinking, OK, well, you know, what what is the West want? What do they want? Do they want shooters? So you have Sega making you know, first person or third person shooters in Japan. And it's it's like it's it's not it's clearly not what the designers in Japan want to make. It's not, you know, what the players in America who wanted games from Sega wanted to play, you know, and so there was this sort of, it, it wasn't, it just wasn't really clicking for anybody. Um, I think the fact that um, the, 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 the AAA console business has become, you know, the companies will, they, they used to make many, many different AAA games, but now each publisher really, focuses on a very small selection of titles, it allows, I mean, it's it's basically meant that, you know, Capcom has got to really zero in and say, okay, well, what is it that, what is it that we do? Well, Resident Evil is very popular. Great. Well, let's make the best Resident Evil games that we can. Um, even Nintendo, Nintendo goes through periods and Nintendo has gone through a period, uh, you know, in the, with the, the DS and the Wii where Nintendo would make uh, or otherwise contract with third you know, third party developers or outside software makers to make all kinds of weird games. Um, and now if you look at Nintendo and their, Nintendo's release schedule, it's very much like, you know, Mario, Zelda, Splatoon, you know, the, the things that are the most popular. And so there has been... You, at this point, if you're making a big AAA video game, you've got to sell it worldwide. And so I think that publishers have kind of figured out what works for the world, for, for the whole world. And it, importantly, that Japan is, is doing what Japan does best rather than try to do everything. Like mm -hmm. Sega didn't need to be electronic arts and just have its fingers in every genre. It can just sort of narrow down. Mm -hmm. Right. And I would just add also that, um, you know, this works, there, there's just, they're acknowledging that there are multiple markets now. So there's the AAA global market, but then there is still space for, you know, a smaller game on the domestic market in Japan, right? And they don't have to worry about, will this localize? You know, that's not even on the table. We're going to double down on, you know, like our core audience at home and make a game for them. And, you know, and, and there's enough of an audience there, you know, to, to make that a success. Just the same with, you know, like handhelds, like it's uh, it's very different, like in Japan, like the sales list as opposed to like a handheld um, in the West. So, you know, I think they've gotten a lot better at realizing that there are these multiple marketplaces and just specializing, you know, as Chris is saying it, you know, what each of them is doing best. Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks so much. Um, so having started off uh, our own discussion, I'll start bringing in some of the questions uh, from the pre-registered uh, audience members. And a few people just wanted to know a little bit about, uh, you know, to contextualise our experience, uh, what was our favourite game growing up? Um, mine was uh, Adventure on the Apple II. And I think that's because it was kind of a cross between Lord of the Rings and, you know, the choose your own adventure books that I was also addicted to. Um, so I'm going to throw this one back at uh, maybe Mia and then Chris. Sure. This will date me. So I, I think it was Space Invaders, but on my Atari 2600. I remember <laughs> having my parents' uh, television and like, having to unwire the antenna and then wire in and hook up the Atari because we didn't have enough space to keep it hooked up all the time. So I would hook it up and play and just like my eyes would glaze and I would play for hours and just like I would see these aliens in my dreams, right? Like moving back and forth. 
<laughs> yeah, we had we had an Atari 26. I was born in 1980, so I mean, we had an Atari 2600. My parents had played Pong and things like that. And I, you know, but it was just it was just a little bit kind of prior to my time. Like we, we we played a lot of games. I played every video game I could get my hands on. Let's be frank. Um, but you know, we had an Atari 800 computer, and I played a lot of games on that. But then obviously, with you know the introduction of the Nintendo Entertainment System, we saw it at a friend's house and. You know, my brother and I were just absolute little monsters to my my parents until they got us in, in NES. Um, and so I would have told you my favorite game, you know, probably, you know, by 1991 or so was probably like Super Mario World. Um, I, I definitely that was that was really influential to me. Um, yeah. But I mean, it just if, if it was a video game and I could play it, I, I wanted to play it. Get your hands on it. Right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Um, so I have some very specific questions about about uh, specific game titles, uh, one of which is from Niles, Illinois. Uh, maybe, Chris, you can take this one. Can you dispel Mario has a mustache? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, there, there's certainly not rumors. I mean, it's this has been pretty extensively reported, but um, uh, yes, you know, thinking about when when Shigeru Miyamoto was creating the game Donkey Kong, um, certainly he um, was thinking about King Kong, but his his uh, giant ape was not evil. His giant ape was more uh, a comedic character, and so he got a. Japanese English dictionary and uh, looked up the words really like kind of like stupid or idiot or things like that. And uh, it listed the word donkey because donkeys are stubborn. And he's like, okay, great. I'll call it Donkey Kong. And uh, even at that time, you know, it's important to remember, this is very early on, these games were being made, you know, Miyamoto was making this game with an entirely Japanese team in Japan. I don't think any of them had actually ever been to America, but the company was, was talking at that time about, the global market. And in fact, Donkey Kong was even being made because Nintendo of America needed a new game to sell. And so they were going to them saying, you got to think about the global market. And they're like, okay, um, well, we'll call this Donkey Kong. So they go to Nintendo of America and they're like, ah, sorry, you messed up. This doesn't actually make any sense. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean what you think it means. And Miyamoto's response was, yeah, but I'm kind of attached to it now. <laughs> like I kind of like it. So we're going to go with Donkey Kong. And um, then it turned out to be a great idea. Um, and then of course, Mario having a mustache, Mario as a character was designed uh, to look good uh, being about this tall on an arcade game screen. Uh, and so Miyamoto thought, well, I've got it. He was very literal. He was like, well, if if um you know if if Mario were to fall off a a a, a, a girder, um, then his hair would have to fly up because of gravity. So I have to give him a hat so I don't have to show his hair flying up. And I'm going to give him a mustache because I don't have enough pixels to draw a nose and a, an upper lip and a bottom lip and give him a mouth. I can't do that. So we got to give him a mustache. If you give him a big bushy mustache covers his mouth, I don't have to worry about that. And also, if Mario falls, if a human being were to fall their own height you know, or twice their own height, they would break their legs and, and you know, be incapacitated or possibly die. And that's why, like, Mario, he falls a little bit and Donkey Kong just dies. Eventually, Miyamoto was like, I actually don't really have to worry about all of that kind of stuff. It's okay. And that's why, you know, Super Mario Brothers, you can fall, you know, from the top of the screen and you don't actually die. You realize, like, oh, it's not really necessary. But, yes, he was very, very literal um, when he was uh, when he was designing that game, and that's how those things came about. Yeah, yeah, with, Mar uh, with the little halo appearing over his head and things like this. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so I have another specific uh, question that I'll, I'm going to ask Mia. Uh, this is a question from Cagayan de Oro in the Philippines. What do you think about the virtual pet games created by the Japanese, such as Tamagotchi, Digimon, etc.? <clears throat> well, you could say that they're evil because they, you know, they just suck up your time and they just draw your attention, you know. And I mean, like they they break the like the the fourth wall of the game because you know like in a traditional game i mean it's hard enough to back away from a game like on a console but when you can bring the game with you you know and the game is like you know like crying for you uh for attention um you know like that just rats ratchets it up to another level and it's funny because I, I studied a game uh that was created in the west called faunasphere which was you uh, hatch eggs and you raise these virtual pets. And this game was really uh, popular with older women. And like these were, these women were not your traditional gamers at all. 
And what I think it shows is like this idea of virtual pets and you can bring in like Nintendogs as well is that like this is an idea that seems to appeal to like almost every demographic out there, like from kids to older people, this idea of, you know, like taking care of something, nurturing something, you know, having something that responds to you. Um, but yeah, like those, the early Japanese game titles really tapped into that really well. Yeah, that's great. Um, so we're getting uh, to more... Uh questions about Sonic the Hedgehog. We had so many questions about Sonic, Sonic the Hedgehog, I have to say. There were a lot. Um, there were a lot. Some from uh, Cononley in the United Kingdom and also uh, Victoria, uh, British Columbia. Um, so, Chris, maybe, what do you think inspired the creation of Sonic the Hedgehog and how did Sonic get made? Well, Sega wanted a mascot character like Mario. You know, they saw the success of Mario. Sega had tried with other, Sega had a mascot called Alex Kidd, which never really caught on with people. So Sega was like, well, you know, what can we do? Um, and so um, they were like, let's just create an animal character. And they actually, again, you know, um, the sort of like, uh, the, the sort of hidden global origins of some of these Japanese characters comes into play again because um, the, the character designer, um, Naoto Oshima, uh, actually took a lot of these character designs and he, and he went on a trip to New York City and he went to Central Park and he just sort of started grabbing random people in Central Park and saying, hey, what do you think of all these, these, these characters? And um, one of the characters that the, you know, most people, sort of random passersby, um, seemed to like the most was this design uh, for a character that was called uh, Mr. Hedgehog. And um, so they they decided to go with that. And uh, there was actually this um, very weird, there's a, there's a game developers conference presentation where they talked about um, this weird backstory for Sonic that was thrown out that was like, the game was going to have a story about a World War II fighter pilot and Sonic the Hedgehog was the nose art on his, uh, on his bomber, on his plane and all, all this kind of stuff. Um, they, they, they didn't do that. And then additionally, um, Sonic, they originally designed him to have a, a human a girlfriend um, that, again, the, the American team was kind of like, that's weird. Can you not do that? Uh, so but yeah, the original the original Sonic the Hedgehog design was absolutely it was um, it was really just designed. They wanted a mascot character. And, and that was the one that we got. That's fantastic, actually going to New York and, and showing people in Central Park the pictures and basing, you know, that's your market research. I, I love that. Um, that kind of ties us into a, another question that we got uh, from Japan, uh, which is how did the Japanese video games first enter the Western market? Was it difficult? What did the people struggle with? And how did they overcome it in finally releasing it worldwide? So... If you can think of any origin stories there that might be useful. Well, I mean, you know, I, we, I touched on a little bit in the presentations, but of course, um, you know, the Japanese video games first entered the market by, I mean, there weren't really that many different uh, ideas or new ideas for video games out there. And so um, there was, a, there, there, you know, very early on, there was this um, uh, a mixing of the U.S. and Japanese industries. Uh, when Taito created Space Invaders, the U.S. company Midway looked at that and said, hey, great, we'll just, we'll just license that from you and then we'll produce it in the U.S. So you didn't. So so Taito didn't have to come and establish a U.S. base of operations or anything like that. Um, you know, with Pac-Man, it was the same thing. It was Midway licensing it from Taito, um, and then of course, uh, you know, even even with earlier games like um, like Western Gun, which became Gunfight, it was it was licensed. Uh, Nintendo was different because Nintendo actually did establish Nintendo of America, um, and so the thing is that, um, and this is what's so interesting about video games is this sort of vanguard of Japanese culture, you know, coming into the U.S., is that um, there, there actually wasn't that much resistance um, to, the, to the games themselves. Certainly we saw um, this idea that, again, maybe erasing some of the Japanese-ness of everything, um, you know, that the marquee art on the arcade uh, cabinets had to be redesigned or the side art or things like that. Um, but, but in general, the, the, the game software itself, probably owing to the fact that ultimately there wasn't really that much you, you could do with the, the pixels on the screen, um, that uh, they didn't really 
where they weren't really redesigned or they didn't really need to be redesigned. And so the initial entry of Japanese products into the foreign markets for video games actually seems to have all happened, you know, quite smoothly. I think it's when the games became more complicated when you started seeing designs that then it's like, oh, well, now I can really identify this as being something that is um, not of my culture. Um, you know, when the, when the designs start becoming very anime influenced, when the designs start becoming, or when when things that are happening in the game, you know, Pac-Man is so abstract, but um, once people start, uh, you know, just to name one example that's that's constantly, that constantly comes up, you know, once somebody is clearly eating a... Um, uh, 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 an, an onigiri, like a rice ball, you know, and you can see the sort of triangular shape with the seaweed wrapped around it. Then somebody is eating that in the game. As soon as games become able to show that, well, now it becomes a problem because somebody's eating that on screen and, and people don't have a reference point for that. So what do you do? Do you call it a donut? Do you change it into a donut? Do you handle that in the text? Do you actually change the graphics? As soon as games become more complicated, the, the localizing them becomes so much more difficult than, say, localizing Space Invaders, which literally was just like, there was no process of localizing Space Invaders because the, nothing was changed. Yeah, yeah. It's so important. You know, it's not just, with translation, it's not just the text assets, but the graphics themselves. Like When they have to change, it makes everything so much more complicated. Right. And we actually got a lot of questions about uh, localization. Um, and we also, there, there's a couple of different ways we could go here. Um, but we also got a lot of questions about specifically, you know, what, what's a Japanese style of game? What is it that makes a Japanese game intrinsically different to a Western style of game, right? And uh, we had people from Fort Collins, Colorado, as well as some people from New York, pointing out the different feel of Japanese games, uh, whether that's um, coming from the characters or the narrative or something that's different, right? Um, so what do you think makes uh, Japanese games, uh, specifically Japanese role-playing games or JRPGs, uh, unique uh, compared to Western games and RPGs? And, and, and maybe Mia, you might like to take that one first. Sure. I, I mean, it's a really hard question. And this was something I had interviewed a lot of players about because, you know, I think that idea of the story, like the importance of the story, uh, like a lot of fans of JRPGs in the West will really point to that, you know, as being uh, key to them. And like the like the depth of the story, the fact that, you know, there are, you know, like these deeper emotions uh, being talked about, um, you know, and expressed uh, that it's it's more than I mean it's it's usually a fight between good and evil, but that there's you know more complexities and layers to it. I mean the thing is, you could probably get into a debate with like a real fan of like Western RPGs, and and they could pull out you know easily ten Western RPGs that that do kind of the same things, right? Um, and like, even as, as Chris was pointing out in his presentation, you know, like wizardry, uh, which was created, you know, in part by Brenda Romero, you know, will like influence some of the Japanese RPGs. Like, so like there's, there's a lot of back and forth between the cultures in terms of like the influences and like what people, you know, like literature, movies, films, you know, that, um, you know, creators were watching and, and thinking about. And so... I don't know that there's necessarily any one thing, um, but you know, in in the minds of fans, like that is something that will stand out, right? And and I think, you know, in that case, it's true. You know, like for many fans, it is like the story um, and the characterization, and also like the world building, uh, you know. And I think that's something that, uh, because of the history of being tied with manga and anime, that Japanese creators have been really excellent at like this general world building. Uh, you know, so that they can like take characters across different platforms and like and into different situations and with different mechanics. And so like that's something that I think they have really done well over the years. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people say that JRPG stories are very linear, 
Right, and of mm -hmm. course this does apply to the earlier works from the 1980s, of course, but as you go through the 90s, you get a little bit more choice, a little bit more player agency, and now, of course, you know, you're almost expected to have multiple endings and uh, different outcomes, and, you know, this helps with replayability and uh, people can swap stories themselves of, oh, you know, which ending did you get and, and things like this. Um, so do you think this idea of the linear JRPG it has gone now or is that idea still around? What do you think about that? Oh, are you asking me? I'm yeah, I can <laughs> say. <laughs> or, I mean, or it, it's so wanted. hard. It's, it's so really hard not, to get yeah. a sense of like, you know, like when I first started studying games, it felt like I could get a sense of like, you know, what are the major games out there? And now there are just so many games, uh, you know, that I'm sure I could say, you know, like, yes or no. And somebody would be like, but what about this? There's right? always like this. a counter example. Yeah. Maybe 10 counter yeah. examples, right? Exactly. And I mean, you know, I think one of the problems is that the linearity of Japanese games, some people see that as a bad thing, you know, and that, you know, this idea that in the West you should have multiple branches and different endings is sort of held up as like the way it should be. And I like a linear story, right? Like I like sometimes when my choices matter, but I also like, you know, like reading novels mm -hmm. and, you know, being given an ending. And sometimes it's not the ending I would have chosen, but that means that, you know, it's, maybe it's more moving and meaningful to me, right? And thinking about why did it end this way? And I think games are the same. And so I think uh, that, you know, very linear games, you know, have a place and, you know, like don't deserve to sort of be like demoted to below, you know, like choice-based games, which sometimes they are now. Yeah, and that, that's a really important point. And sometimes you just want to be taken for a ride, you know, according to the designer's vision, right? And I, I like what you said about assigning value to, to the different kinds of storytelling there. Yeah. Yeah, Chris, would you have any uh, comments on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, it, it's it's when you make blankets, blanket statements, you know, there's always going to be, uh, you know, uh, things that, that, that don't follow along with that. But I think certainly when you look at the development of role-playing games, which, and, and again, yes, um, you know, Western RPGs were the first, you know, experience with computer RPGs that Japanese developers had and those influenced them. I think what you see is um, in, in the West, this idea of the RPG genre as opening up um, and sort of an infinite possibility space in which your character can become whatever they want to become. And you can, you can customize your characters based on, you know, based on sitting around a table playing Dungeons and Dragons, right? And, you know, how do we create a computer role-playing game that, that allows you to do quote unquote anything? And you see things like, you know, Morrowind and Skyrim and things like that. I mean, ultimately they're not infinite possibility spaces, but they, they, they're, they're non-linear and that you can just sort of go do whatever it is you want to do. Um, Meanwhile, in Japan, I think they looked at the role-playing game genre generally um, and said, hey, this is actually a really good genre uh, for us to use to explore this idea of a cinematic story. Um, you know, how do we make a game that is like a movie? Because, you know, in America, people were trying to make, you know, games that were like little movies. But in Japan, they landed on the role-playing game genre as this is the medium, this is the vessel through which we can do um, a grand epic uh, movie-like, yes, novel-like linear story. And it attracted a lot of writers. I mean, Final Fantasy, you know, the Final Fantasy games, you know, were often written or co-written by movie script writers or, or novelists or people who, had, who had, had been, who had come over from those fields and not just Final Fantasy, other games as well. Um, and so I think that it was sort of like, two groups of people looking at the same gameplay mechanics or the same sort of fundamental like genre and saying, um, what, what can we, what can we do with this? Um, and now I think you, of course you see Japanese RPGs becoming less linear. I think you see a game like, um, you know, Skyrim or the latest Elder Scrolls game still giving you freedom, but also maybe, seeing the value in also kind of creating a golden path 
for somebody to play through um, and signposting a little a little bit better for that player that kind of does want that linear story and doesn't necessarily want to the the, the um, sort of anxiety that comes with being told you have to go craft your own story. Right. Yeah, you do get a little tired of exploring all of the time, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, and I really like what Mia said about the world building, right? This is really important to say, okay, calm, yeah, uh, getting this world view and having different iterations of that across the manga, anime, light novels, games, etc. cetera. And um, we had a question from Gwyn Oak, Maryland, uh, which kind of ties into your presentation, actually, Chris. What goes into creating video games that are inspired by or based on anime and manga that are pre-existing? Well, I've never made one, um, but I will. I will do my best to maybe talk about some of the. You know, so um, I, I uh, certainly what is probably the case is that the people who are actually working on the manga and the anime are far too busy doing those things to make the video game. And so as a video game de developer, what you hope to get um, is as much participation and as much um, resource material as you can uh, from them in order to assist in the creation of the game. And so what would probably happen is in a typical scenario, um, or certainly, I, I mean, it's, it's not anime, but we just made the game, uh, the tie-in game for uh, Space Jam, A New Legacy, um, you know, uh, it, where we proposed uh, a story that was sort of a side story, um, knowing who the characters were, um, getting a certain amount of, of, of information from the makers of the film, um, and then sent that to them and said, what do you think of this? Because again, they're not, they're, they're too busy. They're, they're contracting us to make this for them, right? If they wanted to make it themselves, they would make it themselves. So, you know, we came up with the story and then it was a question of, levels of approvals, uh, you know, from them um, as far as, well, we shouldn't write this character that way. He's, he's more like this, um, you know, that sort of thing. And so to come back with the, well, here's the tweaks that we would like to see. Um, and then, you know, regular kind of check-ins. And so I would have to imagine that it's very much the same if you're making a game based on an anime that, you know, that it's the game developer um, tasked with, watching the original content, figuring out what is, you know, what are we going to do that fits in here? And then just checking back as much as possible with the, the original creators and, you know, anything you get, any amount of their time that you can get, any amount of their energy or expertise that you can get is always going to be gold because ultimately, um, you know, a licensed game like that is going to be a tie-in product. And, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, you, 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 you want to hope that you, you get as much as you can, but, um, you, you do kind of have to work on your own a lot of the time. Yeah. Thank you for those insights into the game design process. Uh, we have another uh, question that has to do with that actually from uh, Washington, D.C. Um, I'm going to ask this to Mia. Would you say that the reason why the Western game industry surpassed the Japanese maybe around 09 is because of our experience in 3D development or because of some advanced concepts and ideas that made each game genre experience different and more diverse than the last? It's a good question, again. Um, and I mean, we could, you know, I, I think Chris made the point earlier that, you know, Final Fantasy VII and, you know, the switch to 3D, I mean, that was created by, by Square. I mean, it's not necessarily, a, you know, a Western company didn't do that, a Japanese company did. I think that in the West, there was a lot more emphasis placed on 3D. Um, and, you know, this idea of uh, photorealism. And, and pushing that forward, I mean, graphical realism, you know, like as, as far forward as they could. And, you know, it's, it's hard to say like whether that then, you know, was it was responding to player tastes in the West or whether that shaped player tastes in the West, right? And then they just began to sort of further expect that um, from games. Um, because, I mean, you see now with, I mean, if you think about games on your phone and mobile games, there are lots of 2D games. There are lots of, you know, like um, stylized games. 
you know, it doesn't need to be realistic. And so, you know, I think that there's still this huge market um, in the West that responds to games that aren't necessarily like photorealistic. Uh, but I mean, at the time, I think that, you know, like Chris was saying with the Xbox, you know, bringing in like some former PC gamers and, you know, like the, um, the coming of games like Halo, uh, you know, first person shooters, it was bringing in uh, newer audiences, audiences that maybe weren't playing uh, as many of those games before. I would say also the rise of like more realistic sports games. Like that's something that we haven't paid a lot of attention to. Like that's a huge part of the market that doesn't get a lot of, you know, like critical attention. Uh, but, you know, like the more realistic those games are, you know, the more people are being brought, you know, into to play them. And, um, you know, that can have different uh, global audiences. So, you know, for me, and, and I think also just the rise of more game studios globally, you know, that can compete. And, you know, you see this with both, you know, like sort of the smaller studios that will only appeal to like a domestic market. Uh, but then, you know, like if they are successful enough, maybe they're like bought out by a Microsoft or a Sony and then, you know, like given the resources to, to reach larger audiences. So I think there's just also been more competition uh, from studios around the world, uh, which has led to, you know, like this growing diversity of what's out there, right? So you have games like The Witcher being made in Poland, um, you know, and, uh, you know, being like a global bestseller. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I just think it's, it's, it's more complex than that. Um, I just, I always hesitate to say like that there's one thing that, that caused this or that to happen. Also, I guess if I knew those answers, I'd probably be making a lot more money than I am <laughs> now. <laughs> right. I think we'd all be making a lot more money. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thinking about this idea of releasing Japanese games overseas, coming back to this idea, um, uh, we have a comment from Zapopan, Mexico. Uh, when trying to release a Japanese game overseas, some Japanese companies show resistance when making core changes to suit the game to countries outside Japan. Um, what do you think about this resilience today? Has Japan learned from the success of, for example, Sonic the Hedgehog, again, um, the, despite some of those uh, big changes? And maybe, Chris, you might like to think about this one. Yeah, well, I think that um, certainly in the past, I mean, what would happen is the game, and, and, and again, you know, we, we've, we've already said, you know, going all the way back to Donkey Kong and, you know, maybe even prior to that, um, you know, the, 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 the Japanese teams that were creating these games were being told to think about the global market, although maybe they didn't quite know, you know, what that meant. Um, uh, or have the resources really to understand uh, what the global market wanted. But in a lot of cases, you know, you had these teams, they were pretty sequestered. They didn't really, they didn't really leave Japan. They weren't going to, you know, America, they weren't going to Europe. Um, you, they would, they would get up in the morning and, and you know, go to the, <laughs> go to the office and work until 2 a.m. and then sleep under their desks and, you know, repeat for a whole year until you have a video game. Um, and, uh, they were they were creating it with you know a team of of people in, living in Japan a team of Japanese people living in Japan for themselves and they finished the game and then the you know at that point the U S branch would look at the games that came out in Japan and they would say well let's maybe we'll release this one maybe we'll release that one um, you know and that's no longer the case where the game kind of gets completed and then and then at that point um, they, they you know the the Western division analyzes whether or not it would work in the everything is everything is global at this point and yes of course um you know as as, as Mia has pointed out um, there are games that are purely meant for the domestic market and those are going to be lower budget games these days because they expect to not make as much money especially if it's a console game um many many uh mobile games there's a ton of money in mobile games and so um but even then you know from the from the beginning they're considering um you know what's going to work in the in the global market and 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 doing it in a, a very uh, in a very serious way, you know, that is not simply um, just guessing, right? And so when you when you look at a when you look at a game when it, like a Nintendo game like Zelda today, I mean, that's not it, it's it's created in Japan. Uh, they do have a lot of people 
you know, a lot of um, uh, people that did not originally live in Japan, Westerners moving to Japan and working within these companies now, um, which is something that is that is unique and, you know, or that, that, that wasn't the case in the past. Um, these these are these are, are like truly global products from the beginning. You know, sometimes they're released in the U.S. before they're released in Japan, and the the localization and the translation of the text and everything is all done as part of the process. Um, and so that's that's why I don't you don't really see those kind of issues anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, right, yeah. Mm-hmm. That, that's really interesting. And we also got a lot of uh, questions about very specific ideas in localization, like uh, something that took you by surprise when you were playing a game. I yeah. remember, you know, very often uh, in the Japanese version of a game, there'd be somebody talking Kansai Ben, so that this character's obviously from Osaka, they're kind of tough, they're cool, and uh, you can tell they sound different, but how do you do that when you put it in into English? Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes they might make that character sound Jamaican, or they might make that character sound Australian. I'm like, oh, they're from Australia too. <laughs> I have that connection, um, even though, you know, that wasn't in the original game at all. Um, so can either of you think of um, a character name, a game title, or a key phrase that was tricky uh, to translate into English and, and what the solution was? Well, there's there's a lot of stuff that's really tricky to translate into English, and so it really just it, like how good is your localization team? Um, you know, are you hiring people who could re- and 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 are you giving them the freedom um, uh, to to um, you know make changes when necessary? And the the great thing, so Animal Crossing, we brought this up again. Um, there is a character in the Animal Crossing games, um, a very very popular character, um, who uh, she sells um, futures in Turkey. Turnips. She sells shares in turnips and she says, she didn't just sell you the turnips. She says, uh, how many are you going to buy? It's essentially like playing uh, the, the the stock market because she says, um, you know, I'm going to sell, I'll, 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 I'll sell them to you at this price. And then at the end of the week, I'm going to buy them back at a certain price. Right. Um, and you do this to, to trade the turnips and make money. Well, in Japan, in the Japanese version of the game, the reason why this character does this is because um uh, kabu mean meaning uh, it means that means turnips, but it also means shares in a stock, and so they're they're homophones, and so it's a pun. Um, turnip and, and stock shares sound the same. Additionally, ka- kabu uriba is like the place where you sell stocks or the place where you sell turnips, but also the character's name is kaburiba, and so that plays on that as well. But then the character also kaburiba also means an old lady wearing a certain type of head covering, a head scarf in Japan. It's so it's a triple <laughs> pun. It's a triple pun. It's all kinds of, and that character in the game is a pig because Animal Crossing, they're all animals. It's a pig wearing that kind of head covering and she's an old lady. So that, that it's totally untranslatable, uh, but Nintendo's team, what they did was they, I'm sure they came up, they, they talked about a lot of things. They did it really, really well. Um, they call it the stock market, S T A L K, stocks with turnips, um, and then the they named uh, the character Joan, and the game refers to she's a pig. The game refers to her as Sow Joan, which which references the, the Dow Jones, and so that was how they that was how they got around that and and, and actually made it um, a, a pun, not quite as perfect, but you know that's that's what you need. If they'd have simply translated it, it would have lost the whole joke. Yeah. And so you have to think about like how do we do this? I, I so again I'll bring it back to the, the the Space Jam game, which I wrote a lot of the dialogue for, and um and and we could sort of give um. Uh, uh, some uh, notes to the translators. And so there were things where I was like, I kind of like explained because it's Looney Tunes. So I'm like, well, let me explain what the joke is. And then for a lot of it, I was like, and by the way, if you can't translate this joke, please just write something funny because yeah. ultimately I want the player to laugh during this scene. I don't want you to feel the need to directly translate what I am writing here if it's not going to be funny. Yeah, it's about the effect on the player, right? Yeah. And the, the Australian accent, you know, it's out of place with everybody else talking one way and you got one character speaking a different way. Yep, it um, leaves the player with the same, yeah. We're actually coming to the end of our allotted time to talk about the questions, but maybe one more pre-submitted question uh, for Mia. 
Um, where do you see uh, the Japanese games industry going in the future? If we can kind of talk about the future a little bit and then we'll come to the YouTube questions with Sean. Well, it's going into the future. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the as you were saying in, in your trip to Target, you know, it, it hasn't disappeared. It hasn't folded. It's kind of like with Nintendo, like you see this, I think every other console with Nintendo, you know, it, it doesn't do quite as well. And people are like, maybe it's time they get out of hardware, right? You know, like the Wii U, like, I'm not sure about that. And then they came out with the Switch and people are like, oh, right? Like they're, they're doing really well and look at it now. And so, I, you know, Nintendo is, is still going strong. And I think, you know, as, as we've been saying with these examples, like the game industry will continue to go um, really strongly. I think that there's just going to be a greater diversity of games, you know, targeted at, at different groups, you know, like the, it, it's kind of like television, you know, growing up, uh, like I had three television channels. Uh, this was before the, you know, era of cable. And so like everybody had to watch, you know, like one of three things. Yeah. Um, and now you can watch hundreds of channels. And so it's like that, I think a little bit with video games, you know, like growing up, everyone like thought of like the same few games, but now there are so many it's it's hard to even like have a conversation, even if you're like, oh, you play games, I play games. What are you playing? And you're like, oh, I never even heard of that, right? Yes. Or like, when did that come out? And so, you know, I, I think it, it bodes well for the industry. It's just that, you know, there's so much more now that it's harder and harder to keep uh, tabs on exactly what's going on. Yeah, thank you. Chris, any thoughts on the future of the Japanese games industry? Um, I, I certainly don't want Nintendo to get out of the hardware business. That's for sure. I think as, as long as we have a, you know, I, I because, I, you know, again, you would just personally, like I do so much of my gaming on the Switch um, because, I, you know, we were talking about earlier, like that getting that big TV time in a house with kids in it is uh, is very, very difficult. So I always want Nintendo to be, um, you know, thinking, uh, forward thinking about um, the, the nature of video game hardware and doing something weird and different, uh, which they always, you know, sometimes it's successful sometimes it's not but yeah. um i certainly hope they they don't stop fantastic so i'm going to uh invite shun back onto the screen now uh, to see if we have any questions from the live audience in the youtube uh live stream yeah thank you rachel for uh passing the torch back to me um so yeah so as you guys were having these you know amazing discussions and answering the questions it was kind of interesting to see as i was kind of keeping an eye out on the YouTube comments, people have been kind of asking like follow-up questions to some of the things that you guys are talking about. Yeah, so I like to kind of get into some of the questions now. Um, but uh, so before we get into that, since uh, Chris and Mia, since you both have uh, written games uh, about video games and Rachel too, of course, but um, you know, do you guys have any recommendation of books, you know, uh, Besides your own, that you know, people might kind of be interested in reading to kind of get a, a better grasp of you know the Japanese video game industry. Well, I can I can start off by saying that um, all three of us have written books on Japanese games, and there are quite a few in the works. Um, up until now, I mean, I'm currently editing a book on, on Japanese role-playing games, but there haven't been that many dedicated books just on Japanese games. Usually you get an anthology about video games from around the world and, and one or two chapters will be on, on Japanese games. Um, and so, or, or it'll be thematic, right? And so you'll you'll have a, a book about uh, narratives or something like that, and everybody will always talk about Legend of Zelda in there because it's one of the great video game narratives in the world. But the people that are looking at Legend of Zelda in that way might not be talking about it as a Japanese game. They're just talking about it as a game, right? And same with things like Mario. They're only looking at it as a, as a platformer, and, and the form is the most important thing uh, to a lot of scholars, I think. Yeah, I, I'm totally blanking now on other books. I know there was like a series of books. There were small books about specific games, you know, like this book is just about like Chrono Trigger, right? Or this book is just about Final Fantasy. 
And, you know, it was a small publisher and they're online, um, but I can't think of the specific name of the publisher right now. But that would probably be the best example of like games, books that do like deep dives into specific games. Yeah. That's uh, Boss Fight Books. Boss that's, fight uh, books. There uh, we that, go. That's okay. my, my book, Final Fantasy V, is out for <laughs> Boss Fight Books. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I really, I would I would recommend um, looking at Boss Fight Books for sure. Um, there, uh, As far as specific ones, uh, there's a book about uh, Katamari Damacy that is a, a great um, look at uh, the development history of that game and especially how, again, that was really meant for that Japanese audience. And so the, and, and, and again, the, the process of localizing that game uh, was to not really localize that much, was to translate the text and, and leave it as this, um, you know, this very profoundly kind of weird game because the weirdness was such a, a strength. Um, and I, I think uh, maybe, Rachel, you in your book talk a little bit about Katamari as far as like um, um, how so much of what Japanese people encountered in that game was familiar to them, um, but out of context, it's, it, it strikes uh, the, the Western audience as weird. But it, but and yet and yet it still works, right? Yeah, yeah. And Steve Jones analyzes it as a um, just kind of uh, to a Western audience. There are various things in the game that seem bizarre, but then he looks at why they work in the context of the game. And for me, you know, going to Japanese high school and being an exchange student over there, and then playing Katamari Damacy many years later, it was just wonderful to feel like I was a, at school again in a Japanese small town, everybody wearing their Japanese, you know, their seirafku, the, the sailor suit uniforms and uh, being in the house and seeing the same things that I saw on my homestay. And it's just very familiar and nostalgic and it really um, plays on that idea of nostalgia and, and kitsch. Yeah. Um, of it. <laughs> I think we kind of ran into the yeah. question and, and went in different directions there. <laughs> yeah. I would just add too, not with books, but if you go to YouTube and the Game Developers Conference Vault, there are lots of free talks on it. And there's a series of postmortems of uh, all kinds of games, but like classic games. And so I remember seeing a GDC several years ago now, uh, the creator of Shenmue and talking about, you know, like what he was thinking of and like the original design for the game and like the problems that they ran into when they were creating and developing it and programming it. And so like that's a, a really great way to see because some of these developers will show you, you know, like uh, like how the art changed, uh, like how the interface changed, you know, like why they made decisions that they did. You know, there was somebody else talking about like Final Fantasy fourteen and like the the reboot that they had to do um, for the for that MMO. So like that's a really great uh, free resource as well. At Shenmue, that's a game where I played that when I was uh, before I lived in Japan, and of course that was at that time like Shenmue was like the most realistic video game that had ever been made, and right. so it was just mind blowing to see that on a friend's you know Dreamcast uh, before it came out here, and I was just like, wow, it's so cool. Now when I play Shenmue, it is incredibly nostalgic. It is so nostalgic because it replicates that small town Japan um, so perfectly down to the little details of just walking down the street and um you know getting on the bus it, it's 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 such a it's such a trigger for uh for me thinking about you know 20 years ago it's astonishing <laughs> I think Persona 5, the Atlas designers, really took a lot from that when they were designing, you know, the streets of Tokyo in, the, in their own game. It's very uh, similar in many ways, I think. Great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> to to kind of to uh, touch upon that, what you guys were just talking about, we have a question about, like, world making. Um, so could you explain what elements are important in this aesthetic and game world is it you know the architecture is it the transportation landscape um or is it just you know certain values or visions that's you know reflected in the game can you maybe touch upon that a little bit i know it's kind of a loaded question but mm, that's a big one <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know i think it a, a lot of it comes down to genre you know because if you're looking at a role-playing game and if you're looking at an open world role-playing game, then of course the landscape is going to be one of the most important things. And if you look at something like Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, that's almost the most important thing in the whole game is the environment and how it affects you. 
right? It, it affects everything from the weapons that you're carrying to the decisions on whether you decide, you know, climb this cliff now when it's about to rain. No, I can't do that. Um, I think it depends on the kind of game you're talking about. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think another thing that doesn't get mentioned a lot in, in the importance of world building is the sound and the music, you know, because that creates so much of the atmosphere, you know, and like you were saying, Rachel, like with the Olympics, and I was watching some of the opening ceremony too, and, you know, like hearing, you know, just those, you know, it's like, it's sort of like jogs this thing in your brain. You're like, wait a minute, what is it? Hey, I know that, right? It's like, <laughs> that's that theme song. And it's, you know, something that just uh, helps create the world in, in, in fleshes it out in a way that, that completes it, right? Like in a way that even like the art or the, the writing can't, like it just, uh, it's something, yeah. When I was, um, you know, for for the book Power Up, I was I was talking to the game designer uh, Kei Chiyano, who did a uh, Guitar Man and Elite Beat Agents and um, other games about, you know, just just asking about Japanese game design versus Western game design. And one of the things that he that he said was, you know, in Japan, certainly in Tokyo. Um, we're all packed very close together. You know, um, you are, you know, we walk down narrow hallways, you get on the train and everybody is, is just shoulder to shoulder. And if, you know, somebody has dandruff on their shoulder, you're going to see it. Um, and he, he says, I think we're very detail focused. Um, and it, again, if you, if, and uh, like, it's not necessarily about making a game because in you know I'll, I'll bring it back to Shenmue there's not you can't do everything in Shenmue right I mean it's a sort of life simulation thing but there's only a few things you can do it's not about being able to do whatever you want but it's about the things in the game um being recreated down to the last detail you you people always talk about getting a soda out of the soda machine in, in Shenmue because because every little step of that process from you know putting a coin into the machine and pressing the button and the soda coming out and taking the soda and your character opens the can and takes a sip and it's all shown step by step. And some people look at that and they say, wow, that's so, that's so boring and ridiculous. But the, 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 the creation of that and the, the, the intense, um, you know, detailing of every aspect of that, um, that's something I think that you know Yano San would point would point to and say, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. The the, the super detailed, not about letting you do letting you do everything, but in the things that you do, making those things as detailed as possible. And I think that is is a little bit of that design expression of of the the Japanese game designer. Thank you. Um, next question, we kind of wanted to talk about the outside market um i know we've been you know for this for this uh episode we were talking a lot about Je you know japanese game makers and american you know western makers but you know what about in between you know uh other parts of asia or you know europe you know can we can we kind of dive a little bit into that and where, where they stand in the global you know gaming market yeah yeah, well, J Japanese games sell very well in Asia, of course. Um, outside of Korea, which had extremely strict um, importation regulations on Japanese games for many years. Um, if you look at China down through Southeast Asia, the SNK games were really popular, King of Fighters and things like that. And you've got uh, very, very dedicated uh, King of Fighters communities in Hong Kong and all down through there. Um, so, of course, when we're talking about, you know, the success of Japanese games in the global market, we have to take account of Asia, we have to take account of Europe, Right, um, James Newman's done some great work on how Sonic the Hedgehog again uh, was so different in England because it was slowed down a little, right? And the, it was kind of squashed a little in the envelope in, on the screen itself. And so there are scholars who look at these things. This isn't our particular uh, area of expertise, I don't think, but Aki Nakamura is somebody at Ritz Mekan University who's done a lot of work on the interconnections between Japanese games and, and games in China, for example. Right. And also I'd point out that 
sometimes it's really difficult, you know, like if you would say like, oh, maybe the Japanese games aren't so popular in like South America. But then if you look at the specific context, like Brazil, um, I went there uh, for a trip a few years ago and the consoles have such large import fees attached to them. And the games also have large import fees. So it prices them out of reach of a lot of consumers, you know, unless they're like finding them on the black market. So, you know, it's it's not even really a fair comparison to say like, oh, you know, you can't say, well, they don't sell well because, you know, they're just not interesting to, to like this market. It's like there, there may be other factors at work that prevent them from, you know, getting there. Just like as Rachel's saying with Korea and like the, the ban on them for a while. Okay. Um... Moving on, so this is kind of be uh, more kind of a question about the gaming industry as a whole, um, and this might be different in Japan and America, and I don't know how much of this you might be able to answer, but you know, is there a lot of women artists and you know creators and of games and characters, and or you know, and if and is it still a very I, I know it's still a very male dominated industry, but is it easy, getting easier for women to kind of get into the gaming industry, I would say? Yeah, it's, well, it's tough for me to talk about um, women in the Japanese games industry today, but if you imagine, um, uh, you know what I was saying about the video game teams and, you know, uh, coming into work very, you know, coming into work uh, in the morning and, and working very hard and then sleeping under your desk and, and you know, going home and sleeping for six hours and coming back. And, um, you know, as you might imagine, it was, it was a very male dominated environment. Uh, it was very young male dominated environment. It was a very, um, you know, probably frat housey kind of environment. Um, and certainly, you know, something I've heard about, and I, I never really reported this out myself. Um, but, uh, we talked about the transition between 2d and 3d artists. Um, and, what I had heard uh, happened a lot in in Japan at that time is that you actually did you actually did have a lot of women doing art uh, for games uh, in the two D era. And um, what I understand kind of happened in many cases is well, when they switched from two D to three D, it was very expensive because not only did they have to buy new computers to you know do software to create three D graphics. Um, but they had to train all of these uh, traditional artists who did art and pen and paper and you had to do pixel art. Um, it trade them and how do I do 3D polygonal art? And um, what I had heard anecdotally in some cases was uh, the companies, you know, they had all these women doing art and they're like, um, yeah, we're not going to pay to train you to do 3D art because um, we think you're going to get married then you're going to, then you're going to leave the company or we think you're going to have kids and then you're going to leave the company. So you see, it would be a, a, a waste to, um, to, to spend all this money to train you to do 3D art. So, so we're just not going to do that. And it's this, you know, very sexist, um, you know, incredibly, you know, unfortunate um, uh, attitude. Um, and and I, I think that if you look at the switch between 2D and 3D, and, I, and again, I'd love if somebody could to, could dive into this, um, you know, and, and report this out. Um, I think you see a lot of women um, leaving the art side of, of the games industry. Um, I would imagine it's, uh, sorry, go on. I was just going to say that's really, really interesting because if you, I'm not sure if it has to do with genre or not, but I know that uh, in the Soul Calibur fighting game series, for example, the head uh, character designer there, the, a lot of the um, big artists there are, are women on the team. Um, and it's always been really interesting to me because the character designs for uh, the Soul Calibur series are very highly sexualized um, for the men and the women characters. Um, but then I, I was thinking about it, and of course, you know, the top executives are still, of course, mostly male, and the, the lead designers on the games are mostly male as well. Um, but I know that uh, Jeffrey Rockwell and Keiji Amano and Mimi Okabe have been doing some work on this, looking at um, you know, the numbers of women involved in the games industry and the kinds of jobs that they're, they're doing in the industry. And so this kind of uh, academic work is being done. Um, and then I'll be looking forward to seeing the, the results of all of that. 
Thank you. Um, so I know we're almost out of time, so I think I'm going to wrap this up with this next question. Um, so are there game makers in Asia who could rival or even influence the Japanese game art style? Do you have any thoughts on that? That I wouldn't know. I don't really look at games in Asia outside Japan. I'm sorry. I don't know about me or Chris. Yeah, I... <clears throat> I'm not sure. Okay. I think we, yeah, I think we may need to see that's a that's a big you do, can you need of worms a that I don't panel. think we want. To, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, episode ten. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I guess uh, we should wrap things up for you. So. Okay. So again, thank you so much for uh, your expertise today. Um, so our next session is going to be held at the end of August, and we're going to be looking into Godzilla and examine what made Godzilla the king of monsters. So uh, there should be a uh, sign-up link to uh, in the description box below, so you could do that. And while you're registering, um, we're also going to be doing a, a popularity poll. So if you have a favorite Godzilla movie from the series, please vote on that, and then uh, we're going to be discussing the results uh, for the next session. So, uh, and also if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel and newsletter, please do so, so you can keep in touch with our upcoming events. Um, also, before you go, if you could uh, fill out the quick survey below to kind of give us an idea of what topics you're interested in so we can cover them in our future episodes, that'd be great. Uh, the link for that is also in the description box below. And again, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we look forward to having you in the next session. Have Thanks a good night. Thanks so much, Sean. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, this everybody. Was fun. This Bye. is great. Bye now.